And so as soon as this gunfire started, I'm standing in this relatively small, you know, spotlight that looks like a flashlight from God is shining down, but I can only see it on my nods and it's flashing. And so as the light is flashing around me, I'm standing there and I'm not shooting, doing anything. I'm behind the guys that are engaging and I watched this grenade come over the wall and it was like in slow motion. And every time the light flashed on my nods, I would see the grenade and then it would flash again. It would disappear and I'd see it again and it would disappear and I would see it again when it hit my shoulder. Like it was the slowest thing, even though it happened in like a fraction of a second. But over the course of like six hours, there was... I wouldn't say it was a constant gunfight, so it wasn't, but it was a constant presence of yep. the enemy there. And we knew they were there, but we could not find them. And finally, it's late as hell. It's, you know, 10 o'clock at night or whatever, midnight. This part, I, I remember it fairly well, but you have to keep in mind, I was not on comms with the person who was talking to us. I don't really know what happened, but I know the result of what happened. Our fire team, so our fire team was, you know, a handful of SEALs, uh, and there's some partner force as well. We happened to be physically closest to the front of Zarganshar, where like the entrance to Zarganshar was. And there was a drone or there was some unmanned uh, aerial vehicle in the sky that was flying overhead. And it picked up on what looked like military, military aged men, so MAMs. Huddle, huddling behind a wall near the front of Zarganshar. And they have, you know, the, the person who's controlling it, I think they were in Las Vegas, they had no way of knowing if they were carrying a weapon. And I, I don't think at the time we were able to use that as positive ID for weapons. You just, you could assume they did, but you know, you don't know. And so it was like, you, you have these suspicious men looking people huddling behind a wall on the way that you would be going to leave. So perhaps they're waiting to ambush you or they're setting up an IED, who knows? So we happen to be the closest to these these guys. And so our fire team leader, who is, he's on, he's on DevGrew now, he's a f-ing legend. I'm not going to say his name, but he's he knows who he is. And if he's listening to this, you're the f-ing man. Um, he's like, let's just go over and see what these guys are doing. And so the, we looked at our, our little GRG map and we figured out where we're going to go. And based on where we believe these guys were huddling, we thought we could come down this alleyway and arrive at this other wall, the short wall. You know, it's like a T intersection. You'll, you'll arrive at the short wall right in front of you. And in theory, you could poke your head over this wall and look out across this, this field, if you, if you will. And on the other side, at the other wall, that's like, you know, hundreds of meters away, would be these these guys that have been spotted by the camera. However, somehow or another, it did not get relayed to us that these guys were not on that wall. They were huddling behind the wall we were walking up to, like a foot away from us. And so we didn't know that, and we were very sneaky. We we made our way, you know, down this alleyway, and it's like totally silent. It's dark. We're on nods. It's a lull in, in all the gunfighting. It's like silent. It's eerie. And we walk down this alleyway and we get to this T intersection where, again, all we're going to do is poke our heads over the wall and just give like a, a sit rep on like who these people are. What are they doing? Do they, do they look like a threat? What should we do? But instead, I didn't see them because I did not. I wasn't the guy who looked over the wall. We get to this wall and we've been so quiet that no one's heard us. And our team lead and one of the other new guys, they poke their head over the wall and they just come back down and they're like, they're right there. And they haven't heard us by this point. So no one's making a word. No one's saying anything. And we all just look at each other. And my team lead, he just gets down on one knee and he looks at the other new guy, not me, the other new guy. And he just lightly taps his leg, like stand on my leg and start engaging the enemy. And so like in this, in the space of like two seconds, it's like suddenly there's gunfire going this way. And these guys on the other side of the wall who were absolutely fighters, that's the other thing. How many of them were there? I think, well, when we were there, we thought there were two. So, so two people was our assessment when we literally got there. But after the fact, I've heard conflicting reports about there being up to seven people on the other side of the wall. There is a video of it, and it's grainy enough that there's no way that you could actually tell. But there was at least two. There could have been seven. I honestly don't know. Because what happens next is such a blur. I, when they peeked over the wall, they became, our, our guys immediately knew, like, these are, they have guns, they're these are combatants. And so he signals him like we get, we have to engage or they're going to engage us because they haven't hurt us yet. And when we began engaging them, they were holding grenades, at least we believe with the pins already pulled, like waiting for this moment. If you find us and you take us out, we're going to let go of these grenades and take you with us. And in the middle of this initial volley from our end going over the wall, these grenades, two grenades, at least I think it was two, came over the wall. And one of them actually hit my shoulder and then bounced to the ground next to me. And 
you got to understand that it's nighttime. I'm on night vision. And so for people who have not been on night vision, you know, it's like we, we had these, they're called ANS PV 15s or something where it's like, it's actually grayscale. So it's not green and, and yellow or whatever. It's, it's like gray and blue. It, it almost looks HD, but, uh, with night vision, you can pick up infrared light that you can't with the naked eye and the drone overhead that was basically providing support for us had a, a spotlight, an IR spotlight on the place where we were. So we're in a spotlight, but it's a spotlight you can only see on night vision. And they were flashing the spotlight because we're in the middle of a, of a contact at this point and they needed to signal to the other aircraft what was going on. And so they're like flashing the strobe. And so as soon as this gunfire started, I'm standing in this relatively small you know, spotlight that looks like a flashlight from God is shining down, but I can only see it on my nods and it's flashing. And so as the light is flashing around me, I'm standing there and I'm not shooting, doing anything. I'm behind the guys that are engaging. And I watched this grenade come over the wall and it was like in slow motion. And every time the light flashed on my nods, I would see the grenade and then it would flash again. It would disappear and I'd see it again and it would disappear. And I would see it again when it hit my shoulder. Like it was the slowest thing, even though it happened in like a fraction of a second, because I'm like, that's a grenade and I'm going to die now. You knew it was a grenade. hundred percent. Could not have been more clear it was a grenade. This is, it's, I tell people that, in this moment, which went so badly, my brain was able to function at a level that is, it never has before. And I really believe it was like, it was operating out of, you're actually on the brink of dying. And so your brain is doing everything it can to save you. And so it's like hyper-processing what's going on around you. And it makes time slow down. It makes every millisecond feel like 10 minutes. And so I really did have this weird moment of knowing this grenade was about to detonate. And I didn't know if it would detonate here, 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 who knows? But if it detonates here, it's blowing my head off. I'm, I'm dead. And so I remember as it came over, my first thought was, oh my God, please detonate below my head so at least I can have an open casket funeral and my family can identify me. And so when it hit my shoulder and it began falling towards the ground, I was actually relieved. I was like, phew, it's going to blow up here and still totally kill me, but my head will be intact. My family can see me. And then it hits the ground and I'm like, oh shit, I might survive this. And then all of us just kind of like turned and like did our, because it's totally chaotic. No one even knew where the grenade went. And it's like, we all kind of like turned and then it detonates and it just felt like someone had taken a handful of rocks and just kind of chucked them at me. It didn't hurt at all. But... My recollection of what happens from this point until medevac is not the way that it actually happened. My memory is I fell to the ground and I couldn't stand up again. I'm in this, we were in a, uh, the alley we were in is actually where their sewage ran. It was like, you know, all the shit and piss going through the, the and so I, I fell into a puddle of like, shit, and I'm unable to move. I'm trying to pull myself forward and the whole time, there was an active, extremely close quarters gunfight happening because now those dudes are engaging back, even though that's the thing people don't know is even if someone's been mortally wounded, like immediately, they'll keep fighting because that's just what happens. And so it, we didn't even know how, if we'd even hit them. They were acting like they were totally fine. Yeah. And so, I mean, a lot of times, especially if we're using green tip, guys wouldn't even realize they yes, were being shot. Exactly. Take 10, 15, maybe 20 rounds before it's over. And so I, my memory again is like, I know this gun thing is, it's this fighting is happening like a foot away from me. And I'm also aware of the fact that from my perspective, there was an opening at the end of this. So it's a T intersection, right? So we were looking across the head of the T thinking that's where they're going to be. And they're on the other side of the wall. I fall. And now I'm looking towards like the, the one side of the T, if that makes sense. I'm looking in that direction. And there was an opening in the wall where in theory, the people that were engaging on this side of the wall, the bad guys, they could come around and come into the area where we are. And so I was, I was, I was thinking to myself, I'm probably bleeding to death. I can't move. And I, I was up like this, looking straight ahead. And I'm looking at this opening in the, in the fence, in the wall, waiting for a fighter to come around and shoot me like a hundred percent. That's what I'm either going to bleed to death right now, or another grenade's going to come over the wall, or someone's going to come in here and finish me off. And I had just, I accepted that that was going to happen. And when I really couldn't move myself, what began running through my mind before I thought I was going to die was like, what will my obituary say? And not from a, oh, oh boy, I wish it was more full. It was more just like factual. Like, I wonder what it'll say. Will it say John Allen or Jonathan Allen? Will it be in my local paper or will it be in like a bigger newspaper? Will this be a news story or will it be kind of forgotten about? Like, I was just thinking about it practically. Like, hmm, I wonder what my funeral will be like. 
And so it was just like very matter of fact. I just knew for a fact I was going to die. Uh, but then the our medic, uh, whose name is, who is a hero, like in the truest sense of the word, there's six guys that have been affected by these grenades, like concussed. I mean, I had shrapnel enter my leg and the backs of my legs and my hip, and I'm bleeding to death. And another guy, he had shrapnel enter his lungs and collapsed his lung. And so he can't breathe. We had a guy who was so concussed, he like couldn't speak, you know, he's like totally out of it. I think there was a couple other shrapnel injuries. I mean, everybody's hurt, but the one guy who wasn't badly hurt was our medic. And so instead of engaging the enemy, he basically went into practically a suicidal mission of just trying to protect the people that were hurt. Like he was just grabbing guys, didn't, wasn't even trying to pay attention to what was going on and dragging them to safety. And he dragged me to safety and he laid over the top of me as like bullets are coming in. And it's like also once the gunfire started, the other fighters in the city, they just began arbitrarily shooting generally in the direction of the gunfighting. It's like you could easily hit your own dude but they don't care. So it's like RPGs and, and it's n nighttime and no one even knows where the shooting's coming from. And my medic is just calm as can be, he's a SEAL too. He's laying over me, he's like, hey, it's gonna be fine, dude, all good. He's, he's like feeling my legs, he put tourniquets on my legs. He's like, I think I got you stable. And then afterwards, my interpreter, who I was very close with, his name's, um, he was like crying because he thought I was gonna die. And he literally laid on top of me. He had no weapon, nothing, and laid on top of me until it was time to move, just to protect me even further. Um, but he kept going back down to, to pull guys out of the fray. And it would turn out the our JTAC, who was also with us, he ended up calling in an airstrike, and it basically hit the dudes on the other side of the walls. The threat was more or less neutralized, but there was still gunfire kind of coming in sporadically. But yeah, he just went in and pulled everybody out along with it's another guy uh, who's not a medic, but he was the really badly concussed guy. He wound up going back in and pulled up a bunch of guys out. Um, and then the helicopter couldn't get in. It was such an urban environment. It was too risky with the gunfighting that even, you know, the, the PJs, the, the best, you know, pararescue jumpers who could come in and do these types of extracts, they just like couldn't do it. And so we had to run about a mile through the city to the only place where they could extract us. And as we did, I'm tourniqueted and barely can walk. I'm kind of hanging on to other guys and just people are shooting at us arbitrarily, like as we're running, almost like a movie, like running down the road, not even trying to like take cover, just get the f out of here. And then we get in the, the helicopter, me and the other really badly hurt guy, we hopped in the helicopter and it was like a hot extract. It was pretty gnarly. And I remember the, the one of the guys on the the helo, he said, do you want morphine? Because I was talking and lucid, but definitely was in and out a little bit, but I was, I was aware of things. And I remember I said no, because I, I actually still believe there was a pretty good chance that I could still die from my injuries. And I wanted to be aware of what was happening. And I remember making that choice because I thought I was still going to die. And that's like so profound to think I did that. No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, Share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.